go ahead and get this ball rolling here. Um, so uh, I'll kind of throw out the option of our first question is overall thoughts on the conference and the presentation so far, um, which you are more than welcome to answer. But if you would like to tag on to the conversation we've just been having, feel free to do so as well. The floor is open. Talk about the conference in general, but we can certainly loop back into um, what we were just doing in the last session. And this is for non panelists to respond to as well. I mean, you don't have to have presented anything to to discuss right now right in fact we want you to talk we professors don't want to talk i'm not very, i'm not going to say anything except to procedurally yes here and i see you any thoughts to share Me, Kieran, or is there? Not. I'm reading the questions at the moment. I'll 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 say something if I need to, <laughs> or when it comes up. Thank you. Maybe we need to move on to number two. Do another question. Don't feel like you got to read all of the questions at once. That might be actually more confusing than yeah. not. Um. Well, if we want to go to the, the second question, it's uh, how would you define decoloniality in your own words? And the definition of things are important because if we don't define our terms, we won't know what we're talking about and we'll be more across purposes than not. Well, I guess, I guess I could say something about this. Um, kind of what I, I what I've been thinking since yesterday in hearing um, the interaction between Tink Tinker and Walter Mignolo, and kind of the uh, like the term decoloniality versus decolonization, where Tink Tinker says that he's not he's not prepared to give up this term um, decolonization in favor of decoloniality, which I think is interesting in the sense that like, as he was saying, like they've been, they've been fighting for decolonization for, you know, hundreds of years. Um, and there's a, there's a, a thing that I think like Quijano and Mignolo are responding to where the term decolonization becomes sort of appropriated by the process of like making independent nation states in the mid uh, 20th century. And so like Mignolo is responding to that and, and, and needing a different concept, a different term to distinguish it between that, whereas um, Tink Tinker and, you know, like maybe, maybe the American Indian movement kind of in general um, is still like maintaining their use of the term decolonization um, that precedes this like appropriation of that term um, that comes about just basically from, you know, European powers deciding that that form of colonization is like more trouble than it's worth. So those are those are my thoughts about that. I can jump in as well. Um, 
And I'm kind of taking my analysis of it from Catherine Walsh's um, talk yesterday and that concept of re-existence and relearning. Um, and to me, that really like speaks to that concept of um, decoloniality, of reclaiming those cultural norms, those cultural traditions and language and land that has been um, removed and reappropriated. Yeah, I really liked Walsh's definition or her interpretation of decoloniality, um, especially when she was talking about that it's a lived reality and it's not this linear concept that we have to track its progress um, and that it's a way to kind of be on the outskirts of coloniality. And I thought that that was a really interesting way to look at it because since it is like Tink was saying, such an abstract noun and such, um, such an intangible concept that looking at it as a way to live and a way to conduct yourself and the way to think about things really, um, really helps clear up this huge random concept that we're all talking about. So maybe to move the conversation forward, we can move into the practicality of decoloniality. And where do you see aspects of decolonial, decolonial, decoloniality happening around you? Um, and the question I'm more interested in is what does doing decoloniality look like to you know all of the people in this group who I'm sure have a, a vast, vast amount of expertise and experience in doing so. Um, I really liked Mignolo's idea of thinking is theory and theory is praxis because thinking is an, you know, an active way to work through all of these ideas. And so on a personal level, decoloniality to me looks like learning the correct version of histories and understanding that we do view everything through this colonial matrix of power. And there are such simple steps that we can take to kind of decolonize our own heads and one thing that I'm going to try to do and that I've been trying to do is learn like the indigenous names of landmarks and understanding the history of names. And I think that language is gonna be a really important tool for us to kind of um, help us work through this and help us, not us, but help um, colonized peoples reclaim their own identities and their own history. How might that affect the history that began after colonization? Because there is a risk, I mean, unless you, unless one considers it a positive outcome of completely excising the history of peoples that have come after that aren't necessarily, you know, out there enslaving people or oppressing people, but they have you know, family that have been here a long time, they have relationships to certain landmarks that in an ideal situation wouldn't have existed in the first place, but we're past that now, right? So um, finding a way to not alienate people that don't have the relationship that indigenous people have um, to this place that we're in now, um, but not to ignore the needs of decoloniality as well. Um, I, have, I have something to say to that, I think. Um, several years ago, um, I had the chance to hear Teen Tinker speak for my first time at Metro State. Um, and he was, he was saying um, something I've heard him say a number of times since that like, He's not interested in any apologies that don't include um, land back. And um, somebody in the in the audience asked the question, 
like oh i i i you know that saying like i i hear you and i appreciate that but like what do i do if i don't have any land um to give back you know like what what does the person do who's just in their own positionality without like land to give back and his answer as far as i recall was um like the best thing you can do is educate yourself and know the history um as thoroughly as possible and that like the answer like of course it's not really going to work to just send all white people back to europe um so like if you're here like you you need to like educate yourself on that history as thoroughly as possible and so i think that leads into like for me how how i see decoloniality playing ar out around me um and also taking on like something that walter mignolo has said where he's you know he's saying like he's doing much more important work outside of the academy in his real life and like attempting to use the academy also to um promote those goals um, and so for, for me though, I mean, like, especially in times of COVID, um, the academy so at this point is like almost my entire life. Um, Cause I'm not out like engaging in the city that I live in or, you know, community, community in those ways, I'm here um, attempting to educate myself. And at this, at this time in my life, like that's, that's how decoloniality is playing out around me is that I'm trying to familiarize myself as well as possible with um, the enunciations of the colonial matrix of power and how that functions. And um, building off of Jared's point too, I want to go back to what um, Walter Mignolo said about recoding and recoding our relationships with the things that we give power to. Um, so rather than that being modernity or cosmopolitanism or coloniality, recoding in a way that gives um, gives us a new relationship with the land that we're on and the languages that we are using and the languages that other people are using um, and our relationship with the cosmos and the earth. And so um, just looking at that colonial matrix of power and saying, okay, how can we shift that relationship onto something else? Um, that has not, you know, subjugated certain groups of people. Um, I might want to throw in something that I think decoloniality isn't, which um, I don't know. Um, white people might have <laughs> um, have a uh, might be kind of into sometimes, or might kind of go in that direction. Direction. Um, me being white as well. Um, and that is, I think there's a difference between, um, I was watching a YouTube channel about the uh, video about the history of sugar the other day and sugarcane production, um, first in Europe and then in the Americas. And there was this, um, in the UK during the um, abolition movement against slavery, there were all these boycotts and conflicts about sugar and what the British did, or people that were abolitionists, was they, they stopped buying sugar from the Americas and bought it from India instead, um, because then they wouldn't be supporting slavery anymore. Um, problem is that, of course, the sugar in India was grown in a colonial context and also done under slave conditions, just different slaves, different kind of methods of slavery. But I thought that was so typical, and you see that today so much when people talk about um, dismantling white supremacy and decoloniality and all of these things um, is making it about a purity product of uh, politics for people who are at the top of the socioeconomic food chain. And I think that was illustrated so perfectly with the, um, with the example out of the UK. It's about my consumer choices and um, me making sure that you can't, like making sure that it can't be said of me that I'm the bad guy or I'm the guilty one. It's all about a white politics of purification rather than actually doing justice. And so I would just like to um, promote that part or say that I think any kind of decoloniality has to um, come to terms or have a really highly developed concept of justice. Um, otherwise, I think you're just kind of playing with them. Um, 
with um, signs and symbol symbols like 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 appearances anyway. I think parallel to that, there's also the um, potential fetishization of this whole concept, right? Um, so, you know, if you look at commercials now, it's just, um, you know, the post BLM protests and all that, it's just black people dancing in commercials, right? And so this is like the idea of, okay, now we're aware, but it's, it's still a sort of purgation. It's sort of, we feel better about ourselves because we're doing, we're, um, you know, highlighting this problem that has been um, put before us, right? So it's more about showing awareness. It's more about the self than the other. Um, and I think a part of the source of that kind of goes back to, uh, well, not, it, it's related, but it's not a part of, um, necessarily what Alyssa was talking about with decoding, which I think is um, pretty integral um, as a propedeutic process, like a, you know, a prerequisite process to the whole endeavor of decoloniality. There needs to be a kenosis and emptying out of the previous epistemology, because when we think about decoloniality, if we haven't done that, we're going to think about it in a colonial mindset. So when we think about something like land back, are we thinking that that means giving property back to the indigenous people? Because they don't, that's, that can't be what it means because they don't have that concept in the first place, right? So it requires a sort of emptying out before a filling up with um, uh, sort of action points and, and what uh, idea agendas of what we can do because if without that, then we're just going to be kind of um, perpetuating a, uh, a sort of wokest version of decoloniality that's not really accomplishing anything, but just changing the accoutrement, you know, the, the guise that coloniality has taken on. Yeah, just one more short thing on that um, is, um, I mean, Carl's done good work on this too, on this tradition of um, a white wokeness, which isn't that new, um, it, it, you know, it's um, the kind of the fetishized image of the white liberal um, that doesn't really, that purports to be doing something for social justice or something decolonial and really isn't. And I think that's so all over the conversation that it's really hard to even get at the problem from uh, an authentic place. It, it makes it difficult for me anyway. Other so, people want to weigh in? Maybe b people that we haven't heard from that are, that were on a bathroom break before and have come back now? Or do you want to take the next question, Brian? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and rephrase the last question we've got because that kind of flies off pretty well. Um, unlearning is a vital part of decolonial delinking. Meanwhile, as students, you know, how, however old a student you are, um, we're all in an academic conference right now. Uh, we are constantly engaged in a pedagogical situation that seems rife with a tension between unlearning and its inverse, namely learning in a matter that tends to reinforce the dominant narratives of modernity and the colonial matrix of power. How do we balance learning and unlearning in an academic setting? I think this is a question Diana has a lot to say on. Um, I'm not sure if I not agree, but I'm not sure if like unlearning sits well with me because no matter what we do, whatever societal complex we're in is still going to be in some way ingrained in our head. And so I kind of think of it more as taking a step back and being able to um, detach yourself from your own beliefs and everything that you think you know and stepping back, looking with an objective eye and realizing that you may have learned all of these things. However, there's two sides to every story. And so while you know you, 
you're not going to forget how to ride a bike. There may be another way to ride a bike and then you can do both and kind of forget the other one, but it'll still be there. And so I think the, the best way to approach this kind of decoding and delinking is understanding your positionality and understanding that that had shaped your opinions and your, your own knowledge. Um, but opening up space in your head for understanding that there are two sides to every story and understanding that they're both about, or well, that they both have substance to them. And I think in addition to that is that concept of relearning as well. Um, you know, there's that phrase to forgive and forget, but it's the forget part that's the hard one. Um, but it's a notion of, of relearning all those things that we had originally learned and then attempted to unlearn. But I think it's less about forgetting about them and more about um, reframing them within a, a different context along with that recoding. So um, I think I completely agree with you, Diana, that that's something that you can't really do. You can't just pretend that you didn't hear something, um, but it's reframing that within a different colonial matrix of power within a different um, context. And that kind of goes along with um, the poker game that Mignola was talking to us about in our class after the conference sessions um, yesterday, where like working within the academic system is, he described it as a poker game where you have to like, um, you know, you have to sort of play the game um, and know where you can push your boundaries in terms of like, if you're in a situation where you're having to learn in such a way that typically lends itself toward um, reinforcing those narratives, um, you, I mean, like as a student, you have to like do the thing to get the grade get the grade but at the same time um doing that in a decolonial way means like always looking for ways to undermine that requirement is it kind of um maybe uh, a bit conservative perspectives on unlearning, mm -hmm. I think. And you know, what might be of interest um, in this effort is, uh, and Paige Weitzel can talk more about this than me, I think if she's on, um, but phenomenology, um, which kind of deals with the, um, you know, observing the observer and investigating one's own internal, um, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure of one's uh, internal her hermeneutics, um, which is, I mean, which was really just the, the secular sanitized version of early spiritual disciplines, right? If you read the books of Tissot from uh, the, the Muslim tradition, for example, or the, uh, maybe some of the Gnostics in the Christian tradition, it's just, I mean, that's what they were doing. Um, but you know maybe resourcing though that discipline in which is interesting because that's also i mean th that's straight out of you know the western tradition the I mean, phenomenology anyway uh, of the modern western tradition um but utilizing that to actually kind of um introspect and see what there can be uh see how far this unlearning process can go um maybe a, you know, an interesting interdisciplinary effort. But I'm not an expert on phenomenology by any means. I see people moving. It looks like they're going to the mic. You don't have to be on mute, by the way, but it looks like you're going to the mic. So I don't want to move anywhere because I want to give you the chance, but I know you're like hesitating. Is somebody else going to the mic? Just talk, it's okay.
Maybe we should go backwards, Brian. Uh, I'll go to question nine. Um, since knowledge is a form of control and a tool of legitimacy, and we speak the colonizer language, uh, how do we decolonize the, uh, the academy? Uh, what does that look like? And I would add also like, um, you know, if there is, um, you know, considering the fact that the colonizer language may also be your language, right? Like, you know, uh, my family for at least, you know, for several hundred years, English has been our first language. So I don't, right, to delink myself from English is actually kind of moving away from my own tradition, right? But also I, I need to um, understand the languages, the um, more, uh, rather the cosmology that comes out of the languages of non-Indo-European traditions or, or languages. Did the question get lost there? We're talking about uh, knowledge and um, its, its utility as a uh, control mechanism and a tool for legitimization. Um, so how do we decolonize the academy? I, I think the first thing we can do to decolonize the academy uh, speaking of control mechanisms and power, in the American Academy, is what I have my target on right now is the student loan crisis, which is going to blow up. And so um, saturating the entire generations, beginning from the millennials and on down to Gen Z and so forth with, you know, easily six figures of debt um, as, um, you know, that's, that's slavery. That's called slavery. That's uh, high performance of capitalism. And you know, you look at other uh, nations don't quite have that same debt problem that we have. So it's a particularly American phenomenon. Um, so, you know, how precisely is this linked to knowledge? Um, I guess we're aiming to gain knowledge and indebting ourselves for this. But um, I think that that's just probably the most practical thing we can do right now. And the U.S. is to... Um, kill the whole student loan thing. It's, it's uh, gotten way out of hand and uh, it will be our uh, albatross around the neck probably within the next 10 years. Um, thanks for that, Joshua. I remembered, I think Walter Mignolo, when he gave his New Polis talk that wasn't tied to this conference a few months ago, he had a nice little one-liner that stuck with me, like, good luck trying to decolonize the academy like decolonizing the state, um, which um, I thought was a good one-liner, but Joshua was absolutely right. I mean, if you're going to decolonize the academy, I think it's very, like, you need to talk about student debt and also accessibility because these high uh, tuition rates block so many people out from higher, out of higher education and the people that it, it's absolutely a, a class issue, right? Um, uh, um, there's, of course, the, there's these, like, we can talk about the epistemic ways in which knowledge is structured in the academy, and that's a really good conversation, but it's also just a question of access. Um, if, so if most of the world can't access the academy, um, yeah, then I don't think there's any hope in decolonizing it. If they, if they can't access it, if they want it, I'm a bit tired now, I can phrase that better. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Accessibility and issues of class are at hand here with this, um, you know, whole student loan thing. And in particular, you know, because if I'm going to, you know, talk about my perspective, so forth, um, you know, I might, you know, my grand, you know, I'm Mexican American, my grandmother was an undocumented who crossed the uh, Rio Grande in uh, sometime in the 1940s and uh, was shot at by border security and uh, had a horrifying trauma uh, PTSD over that whole issue because she had lost um, uh, people next to her had perished. And uh, so, but part of my, um, you know, whole narrative, because my mother had never finished high school. My dad has a high school diploma, but part of the narrative was become educated, become educated, right? And so I grew up with this narrative. Um, the English is my first language because my mother experienced um, racism going to school they would slap her on the hand whenever she spoke Spanish so she had this sort of trauma about that too that I had to know English my first language um, and so I did I of my family I have the highest education credentials uh, by the grace of God you know I have a PhD and I'm very thankful for it 
but that did come with a steep price. You know, I'm not quite saturated with debt, unlike some of my other colleagues are, but still it, it's what, you know, it, it does raise questions of what I had to do in order to get my education, the accessibility, the class issues and stuff like that. And, and of course this, uh, you know, what it, you know, it was, um, you know, it was sort of a Faustian bargain here, you know, like signing this, this bond, it's just sign on the dotted line, your whole future in order for you to, um, to fulfill the, um, the dreams of your parents who have all this trauma from all of this uh, narrative that they had to experience of being uh, Mexican and undocumented. So um, yes, there, there is uh, pl plenty to bring up as Karen had said with accessibility and class. Well, upstream of that, I mean, there are also, I'm always going upstream because I, I want to deal with, you know, I, I see that there are core issues that are like the kind of the genesis of other issues. Um, but we, there needs to be a conversation about how, what we understand as knowledge, right? What, what is knowledge? Um, I mean, like, how do we value that? And also in terms of just the academy, what is its purpose, right? Is it for information? Is it for knowledge? You know, are those the same thing? Is it, do we think of it in economic terms, right? Is it an investment for you to get a job? Um, and so then you can, you know, kind of pay back, you know, that's your ROI, right? Your return on investment. Um, and right, I mean, like it's the, it's the whole framing of our concepts of um, what the purposes of these things are and what their, you know, what their meaning is. Um, traditional um, civilizations, uh, they had, you know, many of them, their education systems, there was no cost to that because the idea is knowledge is free, right? Um, and, uh, you know, similar to that is also how we frame our responses to what we see as an issue, right? Because like, if we think of it like as a fight, I, for me, that's just, falling right into the bellicose epistemology of the modern West, right? Everything is competitional, natural selection, uh, you know, survival of the fittest, right? It's all, it's, it's a very bellicose, right? It's a war-based sort of um, perspective on the world, uh, a Weltanschauung, right? And a, a bellicose Weltanschauung. So the idea of needing to fight everything when, you know, that's not actually how it works in, um, the environment, for example. I mean, now we're seeing that, uh, right, trees that whose uh, roots are in the same area of the soil, instead of competing for the sunlight, they actually grow around each other so each can get enough sunlight to grow, right? So, but our way of looking at the world is very different from that sort of cooperative um, and, uh, you know, growing with, going with um, uh, a worldview, right? So, when we see problems, how, how do we respond to them? Is it, do we, you know, pick up arms and go to war as we do with like everything else, war on terror, war on drugs, war on obesity, war on, you know, fill in the blank, right? War on war. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I see that as part of the, um, the control of knowledge. Um, since do you want us to talk? I'm just gonna add something. <laughs> just, I don't know what's my best, my most, my, my most fully thought through thought, but I have a book recommendation. I'll put it in a link to just to the Wikipedia because I don't want to do an Amazon link. I'll put it in the chat after in a moment, but it's um, from Jacques Rancière, um, The Ignorant Schoolmaster. And I think it's a really, it's quite a radical take on pedagogy and teaching and learning. Um, and it's, it has a frame story, which is uh, true, apparently. I, I can't remember the name of a, of a scholar or professor, but he was French, French, and in the 19th century, he was exiled from France, started teaching in Belgium, Belgian, uh, Belgium, and um, he couldn't speak Flemish, and his students couldn't speak French, and yet he taught them a novel that has had both languages. It had a Flemish and a French translation, and the students within like a semester were able to write in French about the topic of the novel. Right, so they basically learned the language without him, learned French without him teaching, they were able to communicate um, and they were able to kind of overcome this big language barrier. And so Rancière kind of takes this and this original professor who I forgot the name of, it's in the book, 
took this really far and tried to develop a method of um, illiterate parents teaching their children how to read um, because it's not about, and kind of, and the idea was that it was breaking down the hierarchy of knowledge, a knowledge bearer, a teacher giving a knowledge to another person. Rather it's kind of, I mean, there are concepts of this like present in Montessori and all of these kinds of things too. Teaching isn't about really content, but it's about teaching someone to learn. And that's not just critical thinking or what we kind of do in the academy. There's also like a phenomenological aspect to that, um, a problem solving, kind of a very tactile um, and also aspect. But really it was radical in that, in this case, in that um, language was so accessible to people if they just engaged it, something that you always think of through this hierarchy. But these students learned enough French to write about a French novel within a few weeks. And it was partially from the method and partially from this kind of like radical or what he would call liberated approach to knowledge. Um, I mean, I don't know how much you can verify that. I think it's a good frame story uh, in any case, just kind of start thinking about teaching and learning and kind of the hierarchies of knowledge that are produced in the academy too. Because I mean, you see people that are, so many of us pursuing advanced degrees are just like, just neurotic people. And I think that's <laughs> um, produced on purpose within the academy, um, this deep insecurity about knowledge and intelligence. And this book kind of kind of go, um, tries to find like a radical argument against that. Um, and I think it's an interesting take, but just to get at the neuroses and hierarchies of knowledge, I think it's a good one, read. Yeah, medical science uh, selects for arrogance and PhDs select for neuroticism. Um, have you heard of John Taylor Gatto, a very similar sort of story about pedagogical, I mean, kind of undermining the standard um, pedagogical uh, ideas over here. He was teacher of the year in New York State a couple times. Um, yeah, but he, one of the things that he did, um, and I, I guess this was decades ago now, um, but in Harlem, he went to basically the, the worst school in Harlem um, and students that everybody had given up on. Um, and one of the, the, the most fascinating things uh, that people you know, began to study after the fact was when he went in there, he went in with the expectation that all of them could get A's in everything that they were doing. Um, and he treated them with that expectation. And what happened is from all of these students failing, they easily got A's. Sim and it seemed it was just because of the expectation of the teacher um, uh, in, uh, of his students. Um, but one of the, some of the other things that he did like that uh, differentiated him from the regular classroom curriculum uh, or curricula were, uh, was to take these students out and these were, you know, junior high, um, maybe freshmen in high school, and he would like sneak them into university lectures and he would have them sit at Columbia, um, at NYU, you know, and law school lectures and things like that. And, you know, his students, um, I think there was a 13 year old that ended up suing a, a pizza place for, uh, for racism or something like that, right? And he like, he did the whole process himself at 13, right? He went to the courts and everything and argued his case, um, you know, something about like him not being served at the, at the restaurant, right? But it was like, it was from the education that he received and taking it outside of the classroom, seeing that these students can learn in a different way and also expecting that they were at a level that they didn't, that they, that they could access um, what's supposed to be, you know, um, a higher, higher level university education. Um, I'd actually like to jump in here and ask a question. Um, I'm curious if anybody here thinks that white people can actually decolonize. And I say white people, meaning like actually most of us here, even if we're not white, we have this Euro-Christian worldview. You know, we, we all are colonized in some, to some extent. Can we actually decolonize or um, is that, some, do we need this, another alternative worldview or tradition to turn to in order to fin complete that decolonization? I don't have an answer, but I would like to say that um, I have had that exact same question since I finished Mignolo's book. 
um, on whether or not Westerners trying to act on this concept of decoloniality is just perpetuating that cultural matrix of power. And my opinion is that um, offering other people the chance to speak um, and acknowledging our positionality is a really good step towards that. And I think that that's our role as white people and as Westerners. So I'm hoping somebody else has a better answer than I do. I don't have a better answer, um, but I agree that um, stepping aside as a white person and like letting other people uh, speak to something that they know better uh, about um, than I do is mostly the work that I've found that I can do in in trying to decolonize. But I, I have no idea if we can decolonize ourselves because like we're from the colony. <laughs> so like at, how do we separate ourselves from that? And um, like, I don't know. It, it's it's a hard question to answer. I don't I don't know if there is an answer. And if anyone finds one, I would really like to hear it. Yeah, I agree. I don't think, um, especially with what um, some of the panelists were talking about with um, living in between and colonized people want like fitting into the colonial matrix of power, but also trying to hold on to their um, history we don't have a history to hold on to, um, you know, white, there, there's not much culture or anything for me to fall back on. And so I think it is like what Rachel and Alyssa were saying, it's recognizing our place in it, recognizing that um, we have privilege and then to use that privilege in ways that lift other people up to our level and making sure that their voices are heard and we take our cues and take our directions from them and use ourselves as a conduit for service for whatever whatever group we're working with to help our to use our privilege to help them um i'm gonna try to jump in here um on that i think that that's a difficult one like uh, um i have a when white people talk about white privilege, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, there's always like, the, not always, but you often get the sense that it's like this, um, it just keeps self-perpetuating, like a myth of superiority. And is, isn't that the whole history of colonization? Like how col colonization, there is like a socioeconomic and a uh, political power that's implemented um, through colonization, which is bad and real and brutal. Um, but there's also that's fed by a myth of white superiority like that's kind of how it's made possible that white people believe themselves and i think or people who consider themselves white and i think there's a lot there are a lot of great works that i can't name right now because it's late here in germany and um but that, that, sit, that talk about how the lines of whiteness are continually moved and changed right throughout history um it, just to take an example from the u.s like Italian Americans 100 years ago wouldn't have been considered white by a lot of people. There would have been a lot of racist attacks against them. And now they're often considered part of white America, whatever that is. Um, that's just one of the very simple concrete examples to illustrate that. So the lines of whiteness are moved um, and have moved throughout history a lot. Um, and of course, whiteness hasn't always existed, right? Um, being a white European as opposed to other people is also a racially constructed a myth, uh, you know, um, and so I think maybe one of the, if white people can decolonize, I think one of the best things white people can do is just like, or people who consider themselves wise, pe white people who count as white people who pass as white, is just to not believe this myth of superiority. Like, because even when you, people talk about privilege, they're still believing that myth. I have this privilege, I have this, I have this level. And so I, I think that just, Maybe that's the unlearning that they're getting at in the questions. Once again, if I were more aware, to put that better. It's unusual, but I 
think I have a better answer, although that's because it's not mine. Religious traditions would say yes, right? Because the whole principle of the metanoia that comes at conversion is about that um, kind of, I mean, it's baptismal in a way, right? You're washed off of, of what came before. Um, although, you know, now have the desiccated traditions retained enough of the um, spiritual pedagogy that, uh, that enabled that, I don't know. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, what white people can do, I mean, if you want to go the Malcolm X route, right, he would say, talk to your own community, but don't get involved with the rest of us, right? Um, and, and, you know, a part of that is the danger of tokenism, because if you're saying, well, you know, we'll just follow the lead of whoever's up there, but then if you are in institutions and you happen to be in positions of authority and, and able to select these people, then, you know, can you be sure, like, you, if you're not running it meritocratically, or um, if you're not able to see through the color, because choosing people to lead because of their color is the same thing <laughs> as, uh, you know, choosing them not to, as, as, you know, putting them down, it's the same as putting them up. So, um, you know, to, you know, in order to avoid tokenism, um, I think that there is, you know, th there is that opinion, right, in the ether that you should stick with your own community. Um, these communities should, you know, stay, stay with themselves or work together, right? Um, you know, after, uh, I mean, Gula talked about the Bandung Conference or Bangdung Conference, which I, I think, you know, is a pretty helpful example of that line of thinking because that was just all the, the weak countries, basically, you know, all the third world major, the major nations in the third world coming together and, talking about how they can, um, I mean, basically it was like, you know, a cooperative effort from all these non-white, non-European, non-American um, communities and traditions. So, you know, that, that, that opinion is there. And then there's the other opinion that everybody needs to work together and then kind of figure out um, a, where everybody's place is in the effort. So which way it's gonna go though, I don't know. I don't have any position on that. Carlos, did you have something to add? What'd you say? Did somebody say something? Um, I, I will add though, I thought about this, I'm I, I've thought about this question a lot too. And you know, just as indigenous, I like it's not up to me to indigenize something. I feel like in a lot of ways as a white person, it's not up to me to decolonize something. But I do think like what is colonialism at its base? It's capitalism, profit, it's inequality, it's Christendom, it's um this moral and ethical exceptionalism or epistemological dominance. And so I feel like as anybody if we're rejecting those things in a lot of ways we're rejecting colonialism and and so um, we can't even do these things in our basic, you know, personal individual lives. Um, but I don't know, it's a hard question to answer. Um, if I could jump in here just for a minute and go back to some of Dr. Tinker's teachings. Um, in his writings and in his teachings, he often reflects that the uh, cultures of American Indians and other indigenous peoples have much to teach Europeans and North Americans about the world, about human relationships in the world, and about indigenous cultural values that can become a source of healing and reconciliation for all creation. And in, in that concept, he puts forth the idea that we should sit back as non-natives and listen and give the dignity to the indigenous peoples that they have, have knowledge of the world that we have not even begun to, to, to learn. Um, before we can get in, and in doing so, he also puts forth the idea that we as non-natives are not superior and we can't 
go to work to decolonize so that we can bring them up to our level. If we are all equals and we need to give them the respect and the dignity that, that they deserve. Um, I'd like to tell you a little story. Um, a few years ago, well, many, a few decades ago, um, after Dr. Tinker began teaching at ILA, a trusted colleague whisked Dr. Tinker aside to share a guarded secret that the colleague thought Dr. Tinker should know. This friend and colleague imparted to Dr. Tinker that in 1893, a prominent Denver physician had gifted a book of Christian history to the newly founded Isle of School of Theology in Denver, a book that was bound in the flayed and tan skin of a murdered Indian victim. This abhorrent book was publicly displayed in a glass case as a treasure at this Christian school of theology for more than 80 years. As Dr. Tinker asked, what were they thinking? In 1974, at the insistence of many Isla students, the flayed skin was removed from the book and the human remains were given to members of the American Indian movement for a proper in American Indian ceremonial burial. Even then, however, Isla failed to understand the gravity of its wrongdoing in housing and displaying this trophy. They demanded that those involved in the repatriation of the body part be sworn to secrecy and required the AIM members sign a non-disclosure agreement so there would be no repercussions against the institution over this heinous history. The unbound remainder of the book was hidden away in disgrace. Although since 2015, the NDAs have been cast aside and Ilith has committed to owning its part in this human tragedy of promoting racism and lasting and generational damage to indigenous peoples, the book itself without the binding continues to reside this day in a safe at the Ilif School of Theology. Ilif is struggling and is in conversation with uh, indigenous peoples to try to decide what to do with the remainder of the book as well as how they can move forward with this piece of history. Um, in their background, but it's not only in the background of Isla. Back in the 1800s, the late 1800s, this is the whole entire attitude of the founding of our country. And if you go look at Johnson v. McIntosh, it's laid out so clearly there. Um, we, in decolonizing, we have to go back to this history. And we have to listen to indigenous peoples and we have to put them at the center today of ongoing issues that they've been struggling with and, and, and facing for centuries. Um, for example, you know, how we treat nature, the climate change, the uh, pipelines, and that sort of thing. You know, there are a lot of nonprofits out there run by non Indigenous people, and they're doing what they think is good work, and, and a lot of it is good work. But if they would listen to Indigenous peoples whose very being is tied to the land for centuries and let them take the lead on these issues, it would go a long way to decolonizing our minds, as well as our institutions and our structures around us. So that said my piece. <laughs> well, that uh, solemn note is actually a good segue into the eighth question, if you wanna read that, Brian. Yeah. That was an excellent segue. Tink Teeker. 
discusses the fact that many natives conformed to modernity and even converted to Christianity in the 19th century without considering the compromises they needed to make in conforming to this up-down image schema, or the idea of one group being superior and maintaining control or authority over another. How do we see colonial compromises like this continuing to take place today? Um, I'm not sure if I have an example of where I see it today, but one thing that Tink said that really struck me um, and, and probably the most profound moment of the conference that I've seen so far is when he said, when I cross over and go into the spirit world, and I know there's a name for it, I just don't want to mispronounce it and um, mess up. But he said, when I go there and, and meet my ancestors, are they going to recognize me or am I too far colonized? And then he said, I'm struggling really hard to teach my granddaughter the, the ways of our culture so that her ancestors will recognize her. And I had never thought about that. I, that had never crossed my mind. And when he said that, I was just, it just kind of took my breath away. Yeah, unfortunately, as as so many of us are so very white, um, this colonial legacy that we that we have means that we ourselves and everything we do, going back to what Jennifer was talking about in her questions, seemingly a colonial compromise of some point. That you know, every every step every step that I take towards decoloniality is tempered by the very coloniality of my existence. Well, I think one of the starts might be that, and I apologize for not having my video on, um, trying not to scare anyone with my appearance, but um, I think one of the starts is institutionally that we have more representation of who we are as a peoples, um, because power seems to beget power. And as long as we have a white power structure that makes our laws that forms our institutions of knowledge, you know, they will retain power. And the only way to break that down and to, to get away from our colonial past is through representation um, of a more inclusive um, population. I think that's a good start. I do like to push back a bit on the, you know, this, this phenomenon I see becoming more popular today, you know, the, the white guilt. Um, I, I don't think that that's necessarily um, propitious, you know, it's not really um, assisting the, any of the indigenous movements necessarily. I mean, I think it goes back to what Jared was mentioning Tink Tinker said about, um, you know, not, not looking for apologies, right? Because, you know, acknowledgement is one thing, but then to identify yourself with the, um, with whatever guilt might arise from that is, is another. Going off of that a little bit, um, I've attended a lot of Black Lives Matter protests over the last couple of years. And one thing I've noticed is this really interesting infiltration of white people and white identifying people into the BIPOC community. Um, and a lot of times there's this push for white people to go to the front of the line as a form of um, protection um, to kind of use their positionality as a way to give the BIPOC community an opportunity to, to voice what they need to voice. Um, but at the same time, it does kind of create this compromise where the BIPOC community is still standing behind the white community and is still relying on the white community to have a voice. Um, 
And so I'm not, I'm not really sure even where I stand on that, but it's, it's this really interesting dichotomy of um, the intended reversal of power, but I don't know how much um, is actually warranted from that and how much is actually gained by the BIPOC community from that. Well, and I would say that I wouldn't strive for uh, white guilt per se. My point was more to make room for different or alternative perspectives through representation. You know, you need to quiet the loudest voice if you're going to hear those who have been marginalized and then consider their perspectives. I think this is a this is an appropriate part where like the idea that I was going to mention earlier could play a part and uh, please excuse me, this is not my field of study and um, I am in an academic setting I am a high school teacher but it's not quite this advanced I just dabble with these thoughts and ideas and I discussed it when I was getting my undergrad, uh, but I'm definitely at a different level than everybody else here, however, I think it's very interesting. Uh, the question of the role of white people in, in decolonizing. I think that as much as we are all equal in nature and uh, innately uh, one and the same, systematically the system has made it so that certain people have power and certain people have don't have power. So I don't think it's useful for us to be like, oh no, we don't actually have the power. Like it's not, it's, it's not real, we're all equal, but we have to see how we, how we can use this power um, to, to revert it or invert it. And I think a, an interesting concept is the idea of not decolonization or decoloniality, but recoloniality of reinviting uh, the, the pre-existing cultures or the ways in which these have evolved through mestizaje and several other practices to permeate our culture and flood it again in a, in a way kind of like repainting the canvas rather than trying to chip away at the at the horrible stain of history and trying to like remove it let's just say uh, I, I propose that it would be more interesting to find ways in which we could repaint it by inviting the culture to actually recolonize and retake over um, uh, the, the world and there are certain things that can't be undone right like the uh, I'm from Spain so the Spanish invading uh, Latin America and indigenous culture mixing with Spanish culture. You have like in Puerto Rico, you have the Taino culture with, which mix with uh, African traditions, which mix with Christian traditions. And now they, they've become a, a homogenic mixture that is, is, is not that easy to re-separate. And even the people nowadays, it's like, okay, well, I'm part Spanish and part African and part Taino. How do I kind of like decompartmentalize myself and identify with which root, um, because I am all of these. And rather, what if we could embrace the diversity, the new uh, third that has come from the, or the new fourth that, that has come from the mixture of three and, um, and, and allow those voices and allow those cultures to, to take predominance, which I think, uh, and this might be a bit frivolous, but I, I see it, um, happening with like even in, in the music industry I have a music background with the rise of uh, Latin American artists being more independent and mixing with uh, African American traditions and and you see it a lot in the arts the intersectionality I think is way more evident than in the academia because arts are more accessible basically no matter what background you you come from you have access to some sort of artistic movement whereas the academia poses the question of access right there's a monetary issue, an education issue, uh, um, literacy issue. Um, so how can we take the model of the arts that in general has been mostly inclusive and in, in, with some exceptions and um, is, is more open and more welcoming and how could we apply that to the more socioeconomic political structures, academic structures? Um, and, and yeah, I think from here on, I would just be ranting and repeating myself. And I don't know if I said anything specific. I was just sharing thoughts based on everything that I translated and that I absorbed. So that's my little grain of salt. Um, and thank you for hearing me out. I'd love to um, 
respond to that. I, so I just was rereading Homi Baba recently, The Location of Culture. And um, he talks about the two, two, he talks about two different kinds of cosmopolitanism. And he said, you know, the dangerous kind is the colonial cosmopolitan, it's um, global cosmopolitan. And I'm reading this global cosmopolitanism, which is prosperity and privilege in a neoliberal um, free market world that there's faith in, you know, this great faith in technology. And we live in these imagined communities like Silicon Valley. And he said, that's one kind of, of this sort of like, oh, we're all the same and we're all living together um, in this multicultural way. But it's actually very much about still about, you know, neocolonialism or um, neoliberalism. But then he calls the kind of um, cosmopolitanism that he aims for is vernacular cosmopolitanism. And he calls it wounded cosmopolitanism, but it's this, he calls it a right to difference inequality. So we're equal, but we're different. And he said, it's not about authenticating anybody's origins or identities and it creates solidarities um, and works toward democracy. And so he talks about his example is Trinidad. And he says in Trinidad, um, the people may be complete in some ways um, when, in their losses, but they've not lost their, their culture, they're communitarian, they're busy, they're noisy, um, but they're still tolerant. And so it's a different kind of cosmopolitanism. And so I feel like what you're saying, Carlos, is more this vernacular cosmopolitanism where people are coming together in their differences rather than in this like one big market neoliberal society um, and, you know, these sort of like um, false, maybe sort of communities that aren't really communities. It's, a, you know, the pe that people are constantly moving for finding jobs for profit, um, you know, and for um, somehow to continue to contribute to the, the market society. And so we, we form and deform and reform all of these sort of global cosmopolitan um, communities, but it's not very authentic. Right, and I think that that is because of the nature of the issue of power. It's like as much as um, the colonizing entities, i.e. white people want to help, like we have, we possess a certain type, a certain amount of um, power and privilege that has, has been mentioned before is, is dangerous to even acknowledge and feed because we don't, we don't want to, on one hand, we need to be aware of it. And, and on another hand, hand we need to de-escalate it. But then on another hand, we need to use it for the empowerment. So mm -hmm. it, this is kind of like the, the trichotomy that, that has us as this crux, crux where like even different cultural and sociological movements have disagreements like, no, we should do it like this and we should do it like that. And we should use this or we should give up that. And, and it makes it very, very complicated uh, to, to kind of uh, create this vernacular cosmopolitan because there's still like, even in the music industry with the example that I gave about the Latin American music, you still have the uh, record labels that are mostly run by corporate white America. Uh, so it's like, okay, we give it the pass because like being conscious and being multicultural and like Latin culture now is in, but if in a decade it stops being the norm, then they're gonna focus on something else. So it becomes an issue of, of empowering. How are we going to, to make sure that the vernacular cosmopolitan has, can have, cosmopolitan can not only have their cultural expression, but they can also be part of that kind of more urban cosmopolitan Silicon Valley thing so that they have the power to make decisions because otherwise we have to dismantle the whole economic system, uh, which is a much bigger endeavor. Um, and this brings back the point that was mentioned before of just allowing people to have leadership roles based on their socioeconomic background, which is a bias in and of itself. So all of these, uh, but I, all these things are like very messy and, but I think as, as the role that we can have to answer the question that was uh, said earlier, I think that the role we can have as uh, a colonizer culture, as, as white people is figuring out the way in which we can allow these other cultures, indigenous cultures, uh, these things that we have othered and welcome them and make them part of uh, of the narrative, make them part of um, 
the global experience and then but not also welcome them but also empower them so that they have the power to make the decision to do that in the first place but at this point i guess uh before the baton can be passed i think structures need to be made so that there is space for the baton to be passed where it, it's kind of weird to pass the baton when the system that's in place doesn't allow for that really in an efficient way so that uh, we need to re reevaluate uh, power and uh, use it, use the power to give it up. And how do we do that? How, how would we, this is an interesting question, like how would we use our power uh, that is, well, it's not our, it's, it comes from systematic. We don't necessarily embrace or want this power, but it's there, unfortunately. So how do we, how can we use it to give it up or dismantle the structure of power in the first place? Yeah, I think um, you mentioned something that I think is is interesting and important and will lead us to the next question, which I'll um, read right after this. Um, but like the idea of a, a culture being in, you know, the fashion of, right, putting on this, uh, you know, Latin culture being in right now or, or black culture being in right now. So you see it on the TV everywhere. And, um, you know, is there a, um, is that can we strip that from the economic incentives of uh, that the powers to be see in making those things fashionable, right? Can, like because people can turn a profit by um, promoting these these uh, these images and and you know the uh, the whole cultural phenomenon, the, the zeitgeist of right now, right? But then in ten years, in five years, in three years, when it's not making money anymore, will we stop seeing that, right? And so, and, and if it is underwritten by an uh, economic interest, um, how, uh, how much can we trust that? How do we kind of, um, if that happens, how can we commandeer that, right? So take it and then, and then make it something that's authentic and lasting. Um, and, and that I think um, goes to the sixth question or leads to the sixth question. Um, which is on the topic of theory and praxis. Um, how do these two relate? Um, Dr. Herrero uh, said that they do not have to occur simultaneously, but Dr. Miolo said that they are the same thing. So theory equals thinking equals praxis. Um, what do people think about this? Well, hopping on uh, what you just said about you, you made a very interesting point about the economic incentive behind uh, the, behind this kind of like cultural promotion. The very interesting thing is what's behind that. If there's an economic incentive, that means that people are consuming it. And if people are consuming it, does it mean that people are becoming more inclusive, or are they, or are they being convinced to be more inclusive? Because like it's a chicken or the egg question. Like is the industry promoting these images? because people are interested in them or is the industry making these images interesting in order to make money from them? And if it's the former, then I think there is hope for some sort of longevity to this because then it's not being driven by the, by the corporation, but it's been driven by actually the client. People are being more aware, more inclusive and therefore consuming uh, products or uh, cultural uh, content that is more in line with the liberal, not uh, that the, the liberal ideas that we have towards a better society and a better world. Yeah, I think the caveat that, to that would be that if it is, if the interest is stemming from the consumer, then is that interest an actual, um, a, a genuine altruism, a genuine, a genuine, um, change in the heart and mind towards something that's more inclusive because of and for the sake of the other or is it um, something that makes them feel better about themselves by by associating themselves with this movement so if it's that yeah. then you know um then there's that's problematic and if it's not that then okay then we can you know get on board the hope train 
Yeah, I mean, I think there is definitely a, yes, and I definitely see a trend, especially in my high school students, um, where like being woke is cool, right? Like there's this this uh, notion of like, oh, being diverse, and even institutions like universities and businesses embrace this, like, oh, we need we need diversity because that's what people are attracted to, and uh, some people are coming from a place of authenticity, and some people are faking it in order to have a better image of themselves protect their self-image and and stuff like that so so yeah i mean of course people are coming from different places and people are coming from a more uh, people some people are coming from a more authentic educated legit uh approach and some people are just kind of like hopping in because that's what the society is leaning into and they don't want to be judged and they don't want to but even that is some sort of cultural transformation that i think promotes change because if all of a sudden mm -hmm. I have a student who is, who is maybe more conservative or, or, you know, he has ideas of racism that he has absorbed from his parents and stuff like that. And he goes to school and he hides them because of what other people are going to think. And he kind of like takes positions and kind of like camouflages himself into this uh, um, new environment. Uh, he could be actually transforming and decolonizing himself uh, in a, in a weird, passive, uh, unintentional way as a result of the, the predominance of, um, of cultural diversity and uh, self-awareness. So is it really bad? Where, is it really about where they're coming from? Is it, should we really say like, it's problematic if they're coming from a bad place or should we say it's problematic in, in, in theory, but then in the practice, in the end, it ends up contributing to the cultural whirlwind of uh, transformation and decolonization. It's almost Darwinian. <laughs> like if we're, if these uh, views aren't gonna be used, then they're gonna get weeded out as we evolve. <laughs> I think somebody else was uh, trying to say something earlier, whether, or maybe not. Oh, other... I was just trying to make the point that it, it might have been cultural appropriation um, if if they're just uh, doing it for, I can't remember. <laughs> I should have written it down. Um, if they're just doing it for the second reason, I think. Um, but yeah, it, was, it wasn't a super important comment, just... Just that little aside. But in appropriating decolonial culture, is that, is that, uh, <laughs> you know, where, where, where do we take that of, okay, so yes, they are, they are mimicking, they are, they are just kind of going along with the crowd. And yes, that is cultural appropriation, but if the culture that they are appropriating is one that helps them to de-link from racism and from colonial strains of thinking from, and become more decolonial, um, where, do we, where do we put that uh, cultural appropriation on a moral scale? All of this reminds me of, I'm not sure if y'all will remember uh, a few years ago, the huge trend and craze with um, Native American headdresses and Native mm. American outfits, especially like in the music scene and young oh, yeah. girls getting, yeah, getting dressed up in these super elaborate headpieces to go to festivals. Um, and everyone who was in their circles were like, oh, you know, you look so good and whatever. And then we had the outpouring of knowledge from indigenous and native communities saying, hey, this is super wrong. You do not get to wear that. Dream catchers are not to be tattooed on your body. And so while that was a really harsh form of cultural appropriation and all of these white girls running around in this, this piece that does not fit them, 
um, a lot of people got educated about it and learned from that experience. And I know personally, I did all the research and learned about the significance of dream catchers and headdresses. And, and so there's always like that, that other side of the coin as to, even if it was um, promoted with, with wrong intentions, it still has the capability to teach and help um, give back significance to people who didn't know that it was there. Yeah, it's almost a weird thing where it's like, if those people hadn't been culturally appropriating something and uh, making the indigenous community completely uh, infuriated about it, we would have never actually heard the voice of the Native American community and we would have never leaned towards educating ourselves. And now, like, if a kid comes to a Halloween party in my high school with a Native American costume, the whole school, all the teachers, the majority of the student body are going to shut that down and education is gonna take place. And this student is gonna have a kind of like traumatic experience that is gonna serve him to grow and be like, okay, so in the modern world that I live in, this is something that's, that's not okay because of why? Because of racism and because of other things. And all of a sudden you have this kid who if he hadn't done that, wouldn't be asking himself these questions and growing in these ways and in a way transcending his own cultural appropriation and his own racism. And I find that fascinating. I think we can, I think we can learn from each other. Um, and there's one thing to say, you know, I, I mean, I've been a student of Tink's for a long time and I um, have had a lot of conversations with him about, you know, I want to, do things that are in some ways things that I've learned from him and his indigenous worldview, but I will never be indigenous and my goal is not to be a Native American. And I think that's the difference. It's, I can um, do things that um, sort of push back on, um, you know, uh, capitalism. I can do things, I can teach from my perspective, I can teach what colonialism is to other people, um, but I can't really be the one to teach about what an indigenous, what indigenous worldview is. That's not my role. And um, so I think that there's a lot of things we can learn without appropriating it. And so we can, we can act in ways that are environmentally, um, you know, that are better for the environment and the climate, but that doesn't mean we're being indigenous because we're doing it in a way that I learned from Tink Tinker. So I think um, I think there's a difference between learning from and practicing in ways that still maybe have the same ends as far as like keeping everybody healthy and keeping the environment clean and, and um, not killing off the entire earth um, without claiming a specific identity. Um, I think when you start claiming identities, that's when you start getting into trouble. Um, and I know that there's, um, there's a group of Navajo um, professors who are working with this one um, global development group in Denver, and they want to teach what they know because they see it as the last ditch effort to save the planet. Um, and so they want white people to listen to them. And I asked them, I said, are you, aren't you afraid to share this knowledge because you're, are you, aren't you afraid it's going to be appropriated yet again? And, and one of the answers was, well, this isn't our knowledge. This is everybody's knowledge. And, um, we can share it. We can't help what people do with it, but we're going to share it. And so, I don't know. I think it's an interesting conversation, appropriation. Uh, I think yes. that goes back to, oh, um, I'm sorry, Carlos. Um, no, no, go for it, go for it. That goes back to the um, discussion of uh, whose knowledge is it anyway? And, um, like maybe maybe the thing is that like knowledge just like needs to be shared which does kind of uh make things success susceptible to to appropriation but it also uh gives people space to learn about things other than the things that they've seen so I feel like maybe the whole solution to decolonizing is like sharing knowledge. Um, just sharing 
what we know about ourselves, about each other, about, and about our own cultures and um, religious practice. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I think that the academy uh, should be like, I don't know, free or broken down in some way that uh, would make it accessible, like Kieran said. That's all I have to say about that. But on the other hand, um, so the book Ceremony by Leslie Marmon Silko, she got oh, a lot of <laughs> she got a lot of criticism from other indigenous people for sharing some um, what they thought was you know, um, specifically indigenous knowledge that they didn't think should be shared. So it's, it's not, there's not really, a, I don't think there's really a good answer um, about true. not this knowledge should be shared. Um, right. And everybody thinks differently about it. That's true too. Uh, Jennifer, I really, really like something that you said earlier about identity and the, uh, the idea of how we can spread knowledge and how we can spread awareness, but we can't really claim a new identity as, in, as indigenous. I, I can't uh, claim an identity that's not mine. I could stand with Black Lives Matter, but I will never be Black. And the issue is that I can't help, no, well, white people can't help being white. And, uh, but when the, the culture streams in a direction that you know, whiteness now is, is, is associated because of obvious historical and racial and systemic reasons with badness, with being bad. And I think on one hand, there's the white guilt that comes with that and all the neoliberalists and the whole discussion we were having, having before about inauthentic cultural practices. And then there's the, the more dangerous, more problematic issue of white supremacy, people being like, no, my identity is not bad. My identity is the best. My identity is superior. And we must maintain it and keep it because it's in danger, because it's dying, because it's being tainted by, you know, the, the decolonization that, that, is, that is slowly but surely uh, taking place in our society. So it's weird. How, how do we, in a way, free the the liberal white person that wants to help from the notion of like being white is bad and uh, you shouldn't identify with your whiteness you shouldn't be proud of it uh you shouldn't even it's almost a taboo but then it's also you can't be anybody else so then where is the space for this privileged being that wants to help but whose ancestors have done all these messed up things and 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 like has power but shouldn't have it what like there's an existential crisis that I think a lot of white neoliberalist scholars undergo because of this. And I think it's because of the initial idea that we have associated uh, whiteness with badness in a certain way, which is, it, is totally legit and it, it makes sense, but it's having these kind of really dangerous uh, consequences. So how can we, how can we prevent uh, white people from appropriating and, and identifying themselves as cultures that are not their own without falling into white pride or like, you know, uh, white supremacy? Is there a way of healthily creating a white identity that is actually helpful for decolonization and for uh, the empowerment of uh, oppressed groups? I think one of the ways is to um, just be aware of the artificial um, idea of racial superiority one over the other. You know, what is it that we fear that we cannot recognize other human beings without the need to um, oppress them? I, th I think that's a start, face our own fears, you know. I think that it wouldn't be, uh, or one of the reasons why, first of all, I don't really have a problem with, uh, I, I don't have a problem with appropriation as much as other people seem to. I mean, there's certain things which like, obviously, right, what Diane was talking about, about the headdress, 
But then, uh, you know, there's some stuff that I think it's just white people talking about some kind of appropriation. Like, I don't hear that from, from other people because it's like, you know, you get into the minutiae where it's not really, the, you know, but I think, you know, if we take it as a um, uh, almost like endemic problem in the white community that they can just so easily kind of um, uh, commandeer these other identities and take them on. And, uh, you know, I think the, the first thing to look at is what's going on in that individual or in that community that they can do that right that they can that they um and that they feel the need or the 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 um the urge the desire to uh have this sort of protean self to take on other identities and i think that is um probably has something to do with what diana was suggesting earlier about you know what where is white culture i mean like white people have culture avocado toast Cool. But like, I mean, like, you know, even historically, right, you get like, go back to wherever your roots, I mean, first of all, white is diverse, right? German culture is not the same as English culture, but you have a history and um, perhaps the blurring of, uh, at least in America, one's own lineage or white people's own lineage, right? Where exactly do they come from, right? Which, which nation in Europe, I mean, not that there were nations at the time necessarily, but you know, which area, which region in Europe, what's their, what's their heritage? And not having a sufficient um, uh, sort of um, pride in a type of way, right? I mean, like a, a sort of uh, identification with that, with that region and um, the sense that it's okay to be, it's okay to be German, right? It's okay to be, and like to, to, take part in those practices, in those cultural practices, recognizing that there are things that were done by these uh, different communities, different peoples that um, should not have been done, but the, the cultures themselves are extant. They have, um, you know, they have, they carry something for the individual and maybe um, rediscovering that, that identity that is authentic to the person will kind of prevent them from going into something else because it's perhaps because of the sense of a loss of identity that they that they find it so easy to take on other people's um uh but i don't know this i'm more speaking from an american context i'm not really uh familiar how it is. You're, you're from spain right carlos so maybe you can talk more about how it is in, in europe I don't think he can hear you. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, anybody can talk, I guess. So do you want to go ahead and repeat your question? My, did I have a question? I think I was just saying things, right? Um, if we can go to the uh, to the next actual list question, because I think there's still. Yeah, I think question number seven is our last one. Okay. Is decoloniality a product of or a pushback against modernity? I would suggest that Mignola would probably say it's both, or I mean, I think he would add like something else because he doesn't like um, dyads. So he would just add, add a third option. It's, it's some kind of triad of things. But I, I think in general, yeah, he would, he would probably say it's both. Um, I don't know what other people think. Usually whenever someone suggests that something is both, everybody jumps on board with saying it's both. I think you've got a lot of people who are needing dinner right about now or needing to go to bed. <laughs> I
I will um, validate your response and say that I agree, Suhib, that it, <laughs> it and maybe more. So um, I think it's it's both a product of and a result of um, modernity and this kind of modern way of thinking about um, what coloniality is and how to combat that. Um, as well as kind of a response to um, modernity to kind of revert back a little bit. So can I go ahead and change up this question here? I have heard modernity equated to capitalism, at least in an economic sense. So how well do we think the question is decolonial, decoloniality a product or a pushback against capitalism? How well does that work? Well, I think modernity in, incorporates much more than capitalism. I mean, there's clearly a sort of um, imperialistic, um, uh, you know, crusade to capitalize the world and sort of just like we're democratizing the world and everything. But, um, you know, there are certainly, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that necessarily uh, communism is necessarily decolonial, right? I mean, it might be, in a sense, it might not be. Um, it kind of depends on how it's articulated and, and manifested, but there's no reason why I don't think that a, um, that there can't be like capitalist decoloniality. Right. I mean, whether that's uh, ideal or not is another conversation. And, uh, uh, you know, if, if we were to follow the same line of thinking of Mingyolo and, and Walsh, they, you know, they, they were, uh, they like to talk to talk about the decoloniality not being one thing and there being many types of decoloniality allowing different communities to come up with their own version. So if a community decides that capitalism is the, you know, it, it, is the economic system that they want in their articulation of decoloniality, then, you know, I, I don't see what the uh, incoherence necessarily would be. It would, I mean, again, depend on how they do it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think modernity is just, you know, it, it incorporates a lot more, you know, I mean, modernity, like a big part of modernity is the, um, the uh, sort of uh, anathematization of religion, right? I and mean, what is that? have to do with capital. I mean, like, you know, they're related and, and they certainly, um, I mean, obviously they went in hand in hand, otherwise they wouldn't have historically corresponded, but uh, they are distinct phenomena. All right. <laughs> Appreciate that. I, mean, I, think, I think we can even flip it around and even say that decoloniality is the result of modernity because yeah. Modernity allows for the spread of information, and ba basically, uh, as a coming coming from there, we receive the information through our technological access, and now we can resist uh, colonization because we have a medium through which we can acquire information. Has our, uh, our conversation petered out here? Are there any more questions on the list? That was the last one. Awesome. Um, well, I have been past the host power from Carl. Um, I will try not to let it get to my head, but I'm just gonna close this out here um, if no one has anything else to say. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for this really stimulating conversation. Um, I know that I have gotten a lot from this and I hope that you have as well. And I hope that you'll join us again tomorrow at um, 8.30 Mountain Time um, for the final day of the conference. So we hope to see you tomorrow um, and the link should be in your email. So thank you all for attending today. <laughs>